Welcome back everyone to the tutorial series on Rule the Waves 3 episode number 2. In this one we're going to be talking a lot about combat. That's the plan. Um, to get started I want to go over some of the options and then I'll zip forward to get us into an actual battle. But there's a couple things you might want to look at before you enter the battle. Um, the preferences options. Actually almost all the things in this list are going to affect combat. So this is, well this is a good place for us to start. Um, some of the items here, not too important, whether or not you want to pause when your ship gets hit or not. This is completely, I think that there's not like a right or wrong answer here. So I'll kind of just, you, the, the, what you see here is the defaults or actually I'm, I'm not sure if they're all the defaults, but it's the things that are done the way I prefer them. If you have nothing else to choose, either go with the default or, you know, you might kind of have an idea, if, especially in the beginning. If you want to combat a little bit slower, you might want to pause on things a little bit more often. Um, allow AI control of friendly forces. Uh, this is pretty important. I prefer not to have the AI control a lot of things, but that's another thing we're going to see with realism when we get to the top right setting. Um, so it just depends on whether or not you feel comfortable allowing the AI to control your stuff. Typically when I'm in a battle, I'm playing in captain's mode and I'm trying to basically be unrealistically in control of all my ships in order to kind of eke out more victory points. Now I will say, getting to the realism settings here, that when you play in captain's mode, there is a 20% penalty to the final victory points that you take home from that battle. So that you actually need to play better in order to um, get back some of the points that you're penalized for playing in the less realistic mode. Uh, if you play in Admiral's mode, you get to keep all your points, and even Rear Admiral's mode gets a minus 10% to the victory points at the end of the battle. So something to keep in mind. Now what are these three? Admiral's mode means you only control the main ship, the, the flag fleet, I mean the flag division. Um, you don't control anything else directly. You know, you direct your fleet where to go, your division, and all the other divisions which are formed um, around you based on different roles or such, they will, I mean, they'll be kind of forming up with you um, unless there's a scouting fleet, in which case it may not be forming up with you at all. But yeah, so essentially you're only in control of one division. It's a pretty easy way to play from the perspective that you don't have to micromanage all the other divisions. You only have one division. It's almost like an action game at that point where you just move and everyone else moves around you. Now, um, some people might say it's more, I mean, it's definitely more realistic from the perspective that you're not in like God's mode, quote unquote God's mode, controlling different divisions, but um, you have to, I wouldn't say that it's mm, going to lead to more realistic gameplay. Uh, you know, you basically it's going to be the AI battling the AI, but the AI may do something, you know, kind of goofy. So it just depends on how you want to play. I'm not going to try to make a value judgment here. That's what I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> okay, Rear Admiral's mode means that you get to control your flag fleet, I mean flag division as before, but you can also manually control any divisions within vision range of your um, flag division. So that's the big difference between the two. And Captain's mode, simply put, you get to control everything beyond range, doesn't matter. And uh, Captain's mode has one other additional perk that when you're controlling a um, division, you can choose to manually launch torpedoes based on like the angles and all that. And that's actually, in my opinion, one of the biggest things about Captain's Mode because the torpedo launching AI is a little bit finicky in this game. You could pretend at least, you can just say it's abstracted to be the finicky AI, quote unquote AI. I mean, the fin finicky real intelligence that you might see of people at war, you know, with uncertainties about angles and all that, not wanting to launch and hit a friendly ship. I mean, a lot of factors going on in the middle of a battle. So whether or not you're going to launch torpedoes, I mean, things might not go as you, I, I mean, the way you plan, that's just like the definition of war, right? Is that it's chaos. It's a little, quite chaotic. Okay. Um, other things. Reduce flash fire risk. This is um, if you want to reduce the chance that your turret gets hit, penetrated, and the magazine detonates. Um, you can still have it uh, happen, and there's other ways your ships can blow up, but mostly the flash fire risk is if you're playing as Great Britain, which has an increased flash fire risk, and you don't want to see a lot of your battle cruisers and all that, but, you know, even your dreadnoughts going up, just the entire ship exploding due to a single hit, you might choose this option. Now, 
regardless of whether or not you choose this, if you do have a flash fire, your fleet will have a lower chance of ever having another flash fire again. Um, so there's this effect of learning that because historically this did happen. You know, the British decided to actually start closing some of those doors. <laughs> and the same thing is kind of, uh, it's all abstracted here. Uh, no friendly fire torpedo hits. Uh, you shouldn't, you honestly shouldn't be getting hits from uh, friendly, I mean, friendly torpedoes anyway, because you're not even really allowed to launch torpedoes. Well, you're not supposed to be able to launch torpedoes at friendly ships, although I've seen it happen. Okay. Support forces this is another important one. Sometimes in a battle, the AI may control part of your fleet, and they may be like it may be way ahead of of your main fleet, and that's the support force. I think that's the support force. So if you don't want, I get this is just a, a splitting of your fleet into two parts, and one part you will not control. I again never really like to have the AI controlling a lot of things, so I have turned it off. But it, and it's kind of it can lead to some interesting scenarios if you want to leave it on. You'll see on the top left um, order of battle, which I'll bring up in a second, um, which is, some things may be named as a support force. Okay, um, the rest of these, can, you can kind of rest your cursor on any of them, but the land LOS, I mean, I'll, the calculations in this game are not too extensive, so I don't think it's a big deal. This says, but it may slow down the game on older computers. I mean, it, it must be really, really running on a potato for that to matter. Um, okay, auto assign officers. This is actually, you know, strategic map stuff. English rank names if you want, if you're not sure what Capitan Zersi, <laughs> which I didn't know what that was, but anyway. Uh, sound and video, this is where we can change the, the color scheme, this will affect things. I guess I don't recommend it. I mean, I, I guess you're probably gonna wanna do it, but I've had some issues with this in battle. Um, anyway, just food for thought there. Yeah, I guess that's probably all I want to cover we already did the one division to show off how that goes. Uh, yeah, so let me jump into the battle then. So we're fighting France, and France is not, I guess, not really interested in defending. It's holding over here. Another um, wartime mechanic you can do is you can set an invasion target. Now, if we have superiority in this area, which we have one destroyer, <laughs> we can probably move some other ships down there as well. And yeah, let's do that. Let's move like, let's, let's say this many Baltimores down there. So if we end up having superiority in the Caribbean, which we should now do, what do we want to move? Maybe I'll just move a couple Baltimores over then since they're available. We just didn't plan this out because this tutorial series is not really about that anyway. So we'll just abandon, uh, we'll leave only two um, light cruisers to defend all of our other ships. Yeah, and I'll cancel this guy. Okay, let's go into a battle now. This is uh, very strange. In fact, they may not even accept this. So they say that we have battleships in this area, but we do not. We do have three light cruisers. Okay, well, they, they decline. That can happen. So we're going to get some more ships here. And oh, it looks like our invasion actually kicked off. We can go over here and see that we are now fighting over Antilles. So that's one way to actually gain more um, more territory for yourself, is during wars, naturally enough, you can invade different possessions. Well, if the, if the value is a home area, then you'll never be able to take it. So you can't do like a, a Normandy type invasion. Uh, Germany will never take France and, you know, there's not gonna be that extreme changing of hands, but the, all the peripheral colonies those can change hands. So anyways, we have invaded Antilles and we are now um, in the process of still fighting for it. Now it's important when it's being fought for to keep a, a strong presence there because you want, the, I mean, the die which is being rolled behind the scenes, they do wait um, the, the, what's the disposition? So it does say that we have, so I guess the short range ships can move between sea zones if you are, if they're both home areas, because we did actually move two battleships into the Caribbean. I apologize, and I'm glad that I, I learned about this. <laughs> Some tutorial, right? All right, anyways, I want to get into a real fight, so let me keep going. Okay, now here we have a convoy attack, which is battle in support of land combat, but I don't think that they're going to accept. Yeah, so this is good, because for us, we now have this um, 
victory in our favor, which will lend points towards a successful invasion chance. Okay, we also have a cruiser action, which is with our light cruisers over here. How are they doing, by the way? Because there's one other mechanic I guess I can show off. Ah, yeah, perfect. When they have a status star, an asterisk, next to their um, the letters, in this case, active fleet, AF, that means that they're starting to run low on supplies. So we really got to pull the Baltimores out of Northern Europe. But before we do, we can finally get into our first battle. Perfect. Let me readjust the screen. And it's just going to be these three guys. Looks like we have... What's the uh, endurance? 70%. Just want to make sure that because they came in with some stars that they have enough endurance. And they do. They have plenty. Okay, good. So when you start a battle, you're going to start it with everything locked under AI control. And usually, and this is to simulate, you know, that the fleet commander, I mean, somebody would not know that they were about to get into a battle. But the fact that the game is bringing us in, we obviously have this meta knowledge that, you know, there's about to be a battle. So they just lock AI control, I think it's a very clever system, uh, until ships spot each other. And then it's like, oh, okay, now the commanders know that there's a battle, so we'll go ahead and hand the controls over to you. But it's nice that you get to see kind of like the lead up before that. And sometimes if the fleets don't run into each other, which can happen, then they will give you control. And you, although you have this meta knowledge, you can choose whether or not you want to go find the enemy fleet or... You know, you could actually use your meta knowledge to, to disengage. But I think that's, I also think that's pretty cool because given that the two fleets did not coincide, collide, or whatever, encounter each other, uh, it gives the uh, player some agency to choose whether or not they want to do that or not. So we're in the Northern European zone, and this is uh, actually modeled as a globe. So it's pretty cool. Um, you can actually, you know, experience the, the time. The, you know, the, the sunlight is more in the north when there's summer and all this, and all these things are actually uh, accounted for. So the, although the graphics of this game are, are not, like, amazing, the simulation level is pretty deep. Um, now, I'm just going to go ahead and run things for a second, but first let me bring up the preferences again. Before you hit spacebar, which is to advance by one minute, or before you hit any of the, the run buttons, if you haven't hit run, if you haven't you know, advanced any time, you're still at zero here, then you can still switch any of these options. So we're still playing on captain's mode. Um, in this particular case, I would highly recommend going to admiral's mode. There's no disadvantage for us since we only have one division, only being able to control one division. Now the only situation where this might not be true is if we happen to take some damage and we want to split off one of our light cruisers from the order of battle and like send it home. Now it's obviously, we don't have any ports in this area, so sending it home would really just be um, a way of splitting it off from the division to keep it out of the fight. But I think we're just gonna play Admiral's mode anyway and hope that that doesn't happen. Or I mean, I guess we could play rear Admiral's mode and then you'd, you'd be able to kind of do that. I don't know. But anyways, we'll do Admiral's Mode. Um, it won't really show off anything, but I think it is a good idea in this particular situation if we want to get more victory points, so we can do that. Okay, so um, running the game forward. Uh, there's really only a couple things that I do. Um, I usually just hit Spacebar to advance one minute at a time, or I hit this button, which is Run, which just runs it continuously, basically like a real-time game now. But if at any point in time, spacebar, sometimes spacebar doesn't work, you know, it'll take like a, a couple minutes for it to grab, so just be aware of that. But if at any point in time you want to run like one to five minutes, you can just press the one key to run one minute, two, to run two minutes, three, to run three minutes, four, to run four minutes, you know, you get the point. So the, all those are, uh, and here's the five button, you can just click this to run five minutes. And even if you hit run five minutes, but you change your mind, you can hit spacebar right away. And then that was only one minute because I hit spacebar right after I clicked this button. So the, the game's pretty flexible. It's kind of, it reminds me a lot of like the Paradox titles where it's like pausable real time. That's kind of what the tactical map is like. That's what we're gonna use. And you can actually see that the AI control has been relinquished to us. So this is pretty early on. Early combat, I'd recommend not burning out your engines too quickly. 
even though if I right click on these guys, they have a maximum speed of 21. Um, if we were to actually go 21 knots, our, uh, there's actually, so these are coal burning, right? You have somebody down in the coal in room, like literally shoving coal into the fire to get it hot enough to boil the steam fast enough to propel your ship faster. So you can actually have the mechanic where you stress your ability. Um, your, it, it puts a lot of stress on your crew and your ship to go fast. And this changes later with like the turbines and all that. And eventually you get the, um, the you know gasoline powered ones. And I, I mean, this will change in the future into something more like the automobile. Um, but right now it's not that way. So we have to actually pay attention to how fast we're going. Still, I'm, a, I'm actually interested in trying to catch these French because I'd like to show off some battle here. So we're going to go 16 and just kind of you know, just meander about. And notice that I am running on full, the... I'm click, I click this button. You can change the game speed right here. By the way, this button um, is, is either shining red or not. It indicates to you whether or not you can go above fast. If you are in combat, and this, that means this red button will be nice and, and illuminated and shiny, that means that you can't go faster than fast anyway. But right now, nobody's around. We can go faster, and I don't know, we can take a look. We're probably going to get the pop-up which says the, the enemy fleets have, have sailed by each other. No contact between fleets. The scenario is over. So that was not like, you know, the ideal beginning. And we can actually keep going. Do we want to continue searching? I'm, I'm gonna say yes. Let's let's keep searching here. Maybe we get lucky. They're probably gonna head back to port, so we'll just head this way. And you can see the um, nighttime is coming in. The first one is is twilight, so you get this dusk or this daybreak time zone, where um, the scouting ability, uh, the spotting ability, is not too restricted, but now that we're in the full nighttime phase, you can see that this uh, gray line is our visibility. I have torpedo range here. I like to keep that one on. I like to keep the red, which is shows if who's being fired at. Red means you're firing at them. Yellow means they're firing at you. And uh, this shows the enlarged window. Let's see, lock. Another thing you can do is, especially if you only have one division, it's pretty useful. You can just lock yourself to the division. Now when I hit go, I'm actually going to be locked with this. So they're going to stay centered on my screen. Well, not even centered, but they're just going to stay in the exact same area. Let's keep searching just because I want to keep showing off other game mechanics. So yeah, we have the um, same range. There it is, main gun range. That's what I wanted to say. This um, dark red circle is the limit of your gun range. So you can see at nighttime, it makes sense our gun range is way beyond our visibility range. So we can't really see anything, but as soon as we find a ship, we're gonna be able to shoot at it. Range will not be a problem. In fact, it's almost a problem that when we see something, both ships will almost be in torpedo range. And that's really the, the chaos of knife fights, is that they end up being like knife fights. <laughs> yeah, where you just end up lobbing a lot of torpedoes, destroyers are king in those kind of confrontations. This makes sense. I mean, it reminds me a lot of the Battle of Guadalcanal, but um, what was this island called again? Santa Cruz or whatever. Anyways, the one where um, you had this nighttime engagement between the Japanese and the and the um, American forces, and you know you had ships lobbing torpedoes at each other and and the night gunfire. Yeah, so it's not desirable for um, your capital ships. <laughs> Um, in that case, I think that, oh, we're still in locked mode, so let's turn off that. Yeah, we're probably not going to find anything at night, though. So let's go down to cruise, and we'll, at this time, we'll actually let the, uh, we'll let the game finish. Okay, it actually didn't give us an option. So the, there was three of our light cruisers, actually, I know, protected cruisers. This is before light cruiser really became a thing. Um, and we were up against an armored cruiser and three destroyers. Well, that seems like it may have been good that we didn't end up getting into an engagement. So I'm going to click the, click the ship details. We're not late enough in the game to worry about air details yet. And we can see what exactly we avoided fighting. Well, this is a very beefy armored cruiser. In fact, this is almost as big as our battleships. 
Uh, we are very lucky we did not run into this thing. It would have just completely ignored our armored cruiser, I mean our protected cruiser guns, and would have slaughtered us, frankly. <laughs> I mean, look at its secondary guns are bigger than our primaries, I think. 14 7 inch guns, which means 7 7 inch guns per side. And we'd be fighting with um, 8 6 inch guns, so 4 6 inch guns per side. So we, if all three of our ships were firing, we'd be firing 12 6 inch guns, while they'd be firing 7 7 inch guns and four, I think, nine inch guns, that would be, uh, I mean, they would be probably putting our ships down very quickly and we would have a hard time even penetrating their armor. So we got pretty lucky here. Okay, um, by the way, there is this button as well, which is the kind of auto resolve. Um, oh yeah, we can see that it, they weren't that far away from us, you know? I mean, it's pretty big in terms of not being able to see each other because now it's nighttime. But during the daytime, our visibility is probably maybe like double our main gun range. So we weren't that far away from detecting them. Uh, again, that was a good thing it didn't happen. So um, there was a, a mission objective there, and it was to actually sink some transports. Because we didn't do that, the enemy successfully defended their transports, and they're given a couple of victory points. This is a really minor battle. So 150 enemy victory points. Is, is is very small. This is like one of the smallest battles you could have. This, I am only saying this to give you a set, a, like a sense of the scale of victory points. Okay, latest army offensive was halted by the enemy after a 200 yard advance. Apparently we are attacking them. Oh, maybe this is, I mean, this is not specific to our invasion, but I think it, we can apply it there because there's no other frontal servant. <laughs> there's no other place where you know, the French and American forces should be at war, that we don't share a border. So, yeah, anyways, the game, enemy, there'll be these little random events which might give victory points one place or another. Not a big deal. These are intentionally small to not override player agency, which is kind of ironic now that I think about it because there's a lot of other things which will override player agency, like the peace deal itself. But anyway, so we've actually commissioned some submarines here and another light cruiser, which is good and a whole bunch of things, but mainly I'm gonna cut away again until I get back into another battle. Okay, another chance at a battle here. We have a cruiser action against France in the Philippines. So not a, not maybe where I expected the battle to come, but okay, and this is a single ship one. Probably I won't show all of this battle because there's not much we can really talk about in a single ship battle. It's just basic control. Yes, the enemy, Looks like they're going to have more than one ship. We see two. Um, yeah, but I, I think I covered some of the basics already. Probably the first thing we're going to want to do in this one is, what's our maximum speed? 21. We'll go up to 20. I won't max out quite yet. If these are indeed protected cruisers and not armored cruisers, then we are at a huge advantage. And they are indeed. Now, they might be the lead escort, the um, spotting crew for an armored cruiser but it doesn't appear to be that that way. So here we go, here we go. We're just gonna try to catch up to them as best as possible and we wanna engage them because we are bigger and better. And I'm saying that, honestly, before I say that, I just hit space bar, right click on them and verify this. Yeah, so two six inch guns, three inch belt is pretty heavy for a protected cruiser. Um, the games in this, uh, the ships in this game all appear to have pretty strong deck armor in the early era, stronger than I would have expected. I'm not sure what the historical, if it's maybe historically accurate that way, okay, in the circle, is just awful. Fast enough that she can keep up with us or, you know, pace us, and the Truda can actually uh, outpace us. So we might be able to get a kill though if we can land a few hits. Um, before they uh, have a chance to disengage. So we mostly are going to stay nose on with them. Uh, okay, wow, we, we actually got hit a few times there. Luckily for us, our conning tower was hit, and luckily for me, it's not my own ship design, which very rarely do I include <laughs> conning tower armor for. It's just a personal play style decision. So after we hit them a few times, I hope we can get the Truda as well. So hopefully the damage to them is worse than the damage to me. 
I don't know what kind of damage we took, but we can see that squad max, we're slowly losing speed here. We're down to 19. And we are, oh, okay, there's, there's some hits. So we have the bigger ship, which means that our endurance is probably going to be worse than theirs. But, you know, keep landing these hits on the Truda and maybe things we can change things around. We got a belt hit, but it, I should explain this as well. This is one thing I really should explain, is to break down a lot of the reports. Um, we don't know exactly what our hit, hit is doing, we just know when we hit. Alright, superstructure was hit and splinters perforate uptakes. This usually means it's some damage to your engine. The uptakes is like where you're pulling in air from uh, in order to supply your... It's for the fueling the engines with things other than, you know, combustibles. Um, climbing tower hit, there's a 50% chance when you get a bridge hit that it'll go, I mean, at least it used to be this way, that it'll go to the conning tower, 50% chance it'll just go to the bridge. So when it hits the conning tower, then your conning tower armor goes into play. And if it doesn't penetrate your conning tower armor, very good, it's just a normal non-penetrating hit. If it does, it acts like a bridge hit and it kills your command staff which has a very detrimental effect on your combat effectiveness, as you can imagine. D stands for deck. I don't imagine we're gonna take any penetrating hits for the deck. Um, our deck armor is probably two. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's probably too thick to be penetrated by the six inch guns or anything, uh, anything smaller than that. Uh, BE is belt extended. So you, you typically don't have as much armor on the like very front part, very back part of your belt, the places that are not covering the critical infrastructure. That is known as the extended belt or belt extended. And secondary battery hit that speaks for itself. We had probably a hit on our, what do we have? Four inch secondary, six inch secondaries? I don't know. Engine room hit, but the important thing to note here is we don't even have an example. They have not yet penetrated any of our armor. Um, if there's a star by the, the hit, that means it actually penetrated the armor. So what this actually means is that they have had no penetrating hits on um, on our ship so far. So we have four and a half inch belt. We only have one and a half inch deck. That's less than I expected. But wow, seven four inch guns per side. So 14, we need seven on each side. That's quite a lot of, of gunnery we're bringing to bear on these uh, poor ships. So hopefully we can use those, yeah, we're using the seven, six inch guns to fire at the Truda, which is good. We've actually done a lot of damage to her and we're landing eight inch shells as well. Of course, if we can, like this is a great round for us, we landed three hits. I, I actually hope that we can get close enough to get hit a few more times just so I can showcase, uh, you know, like getting hit and what a penetration looks like. But it looks like we're simply gonna sink the Truda. She's now down to no speed. So we, can, we do expect that she is, uh, you know, going to be sinking at this point. Now, because she's slowed down a lot, it's going to increase our chances of landing a torpedo hit. Okay, she's now stopped, which is going to greatly increase our chance. So I'm going to go ahead and line up a torpedo launch. Now that I'm pretty much broadside on with her, I can uh, open up the fleet command, and only when you are in cap captain's mode you can hit fire torpedoes and bring up this special window, which allows you to pick a target, choose your which torpedo tube to launch out of. We'll launch out of, we only have one on each side, so we'll launch out of the starboard submerged side. And low, this um, number does not mean low accuracy or low range or anything, but this actually means is low speed. And I'll show the, what that actually, the reason why that is, because we're, um, greater than halfway, um, we're like outside of halfway of the radius of this circle. So in the inner half, you're going to see high, and then the outer half, well, depending on this, the speed of the ship. If this, if this ship was actually moving, it would have to calculate the trajectory of where the torpedo would need to go. So even if it was, if it was coming towards us, maybe nose on or something like that, it might say high, even though it's like on the fringes. Or it might say low if this thing is going even going away from us, right in front of us. Uh, low is just referring to the speed of the torpedo. 
So I'll launch that. There's not really feedback here. There is a, a sound effect which plays, but I have my sound pretty low. And then let me go right click on the ship and we can see down here, we can either launch a torpedo at a speed of 25, 25 knots, and that'll go 800. So this is actually less, slightly less than half of the, the blue circle. Or the outer circle we see there, the blue one, that's launching a torpedo at only 15 knots. That is slower than our ship by, by a significant amount. Even with our greats fouled, which means that um, we've been, we have these coal ships and uh, you have to clean things and all that. I guess coal is not a very clean burning substance, people probably know. Uh, essentially, it's just a fatigue of the ship. Um, you need to do some maintenance on the ship to clean everything up. When the grates are fouled, it reduces your top speed. That's the ultimate effect of it. Um, so you can also see here we launched our submerged starboard broadside mount for the torpedoes. We still have one remaining in the port side, and we are we have one additional reload after this. I mean, actually, we have two additional reloads. You can see that we have no nothing is loaded right now. We just launched it, but um, each of these submerged mounts carries three torpedoes total. Okay, um, that's. Uh, I guess while I'm there, I might as well show one other thing. If you want to know what's going on as far as like why you're hitting or why you're not hitting, you can always go to these two things. They used to be one, but now hit chance is actually hit chance is something separate. Oh my gosh, I'm recording. Sorry, let me shift this. And uh, this is just uh, again just an artifact of yeah, of, uh, recording how how you need to record rule waves. Okay, here we are back. Hopefully you didn't miss any of the good stuff, but I don't think so. Normally it's it's a little bit annoying that the window's off, but it doesn't usually obscure it since it's the fringes which is off. Usually doesn't obscure gameplay. So yeah, anyway, accuracy report. You can see the distance, which definitely has an impact on accuracy. From what I remember, I'm not sure what it starts from and what it goes to, but basically your accuracy, I think, is a linear function of the range to the target to ma out of max range. So let's say that there's a base accuracy of 10% and a maximum accuracy of 20%. You'll have your maximum accuracy of 20%, which is a number I'm inventing, by the way. I have no idea what the actual numbers are. Your maximum accuracy will be if they're just adjacent to you. And then you'll only have a 10% accuracy, the least when you're all the way at maximum range. Uh, maximum range also, um, the range you're firing at, I should say, also influences whether or not you're going to be hitting the belt armor or the deck armor which makes sense. In order to fire, fire longer distances, you have to arc the gun more, and you're more likely to hit the deck. Okay, so basic hit chance for us here is 16.75. I have no idea, I, I, I can't tell you, can't stress enough that the numbers 10 and 20 I just completely made up, but this might actually lend some credence to those values. 16.75, well, we're pretty close to, we're pretty close to the ship compared to our maximum range, which I'll show in a second. We have crew quality, which is increasing our chance. Target's low speed is giving us a big bonus. Now note that that's also applying to you against other people. So if you want to become less, uh, if you want to become more difficult to hit, then increase your speed. Typically, when you're going too fast, it also has a negative effect on your, uh, on your um, accuracy. But I don't see that listed here. So apparently 18 out of 21 is not so high that it is uh, decreasing our, our hit chance, or at least it's not reported here. Um, because our ship is turning, we have a negative 60 effect on this. So basically if you're not, it's very important to keep your ship running in straight lines for as long as possible. And I should have mentioned that I was doing that a lot during this, where I would just try to leave the Pittsburgh on a, a straight course to buy a little bit of time for us to gain accuracy. I don't know if it's showing it here. It, it doesn't look like it is. But um, if you are uh, hitting, if you have a hit in the previous turns recently, you also have a higher chance to hit because you can basically keep firing at essentially the same range and the same gun position and hopefully achieve the same effect. Okay, so final gun, per uh, final percentage after all these things are mostly subtracted <laughs> is we're down to 5.26. 
which is pretty bad. <laughs> 5% chance to hit. That's why we're not hitting a whole lot. But we're going to launch that torpedo. I thought we launched it already. There it is. So basically, we shouldn't worry too much about it because this is about to happen, where we hit them with a torpedo. Comes up in blue. And that is almost surely going to double sink a ship, which is almost surely already sinking. So we're just going to move right on to the Sirkov here. Um, I don't think there's much more to explain. But if they can land a hit against me, at least we can explain. Uh, I can show the, the little asterisk. But, you know, you probably already understand it, what it is. We need to clean the grates. We slowed down probably again. Nope, still at 18. Okay. So we're slowly chasing this ship beyond. Uh, so we're only at halfway our range, uh, half of our maximum range, which means we will be able to fire for quite a little bit longer. But also our main guns might be becoming depleted. Well, anyway, I, I guess I should really run this one a little bit faster um, because it doesn't really matter the result, and it's a it's a foregone conclusion that this, this is it's not it's not a fleet action, which would also be a little bit more important to show. So we'll probably just run this guy out until we can't run anymore. We're not hitting very often. He's probably going to... I don't know what he's doing. And we lost him, so that'll be the end of the the end of the battle. Go up to ultra, ultra fast. Okay, there it is. So we sank one and we... Oh, we did... Well, um, I'm very, very, very surprised. I'm very glad also that this is not part of my YouTube campaign because I would be very upset if it was. Um, despite hitting this thing with a torpedo and a bunch of guns, it actually survived. This is a 4,100 4, ton ship in 1900 to survive a torpedo hit after being decimated by gunfire is... Um, it's incredible. And I mean incredible as in unbelievable. And I, I mean unbelievable as in not like awesome or whatever. It's just like, I cannot believe it. <laughs> but it happened, and thank God, I, as I said, it happened during a tutorial series, which I don't care too much about. So we'll, uh, we'll just let them live. Fair enough. Okay, so I will uh, cut back in when we have a fleet battle. Actually, I see this video has gone on a little bit long as it is, so I'll probably just cut this one. And in the next episode, we'll cover first, maybe start off with some fleet battles, or maybe I'll just cover fleet battles when I do carriers, which is the thing I wanted to cover next anyway. So note that these tutorial videos are coming out pretty far and few between. That's all right. I don't mind. Um, Mace, I'm actually doing editing and all that stuff, so it's going to take a long time to put these all together. Um, but you can expect that there will be at least a third tutorial video that covers the carrier era and um, also the missiles.